In the 19th century, many Chinese arrive in the lawless American frontier to seek gold at the height of the California gold rush. They struggle to survive against all odds. This is the story of the Chinese in a place they called Gold Mountain. In the mid-1800s, over 300,000 Chinese sailed to America's west coast. A young fishmonger named Fat Hing Chin is among the earliest immigrants. His story is typical of many who set out in the hope of finding riches. In China, the Manchu rulers have banned emigration, so he bribes a guard to slip aboard a foreign ship. Most of Fat's fellow voyagers are peasants and craftsmen. They're sailing almost a third of the way around the world to a remote place they know virtually nothing about. Why did so many Chinese venture far into the remotest parts of America's frontier? An accidental discovery creates the spark. On January 24, 1848, a carpenter is working by the American River near Sacramento, California. A sparkle of light catches his eye. It's gold. His discovery of riches to be had for the taking sets off a flood of immigrants from every part of the globe including many from China, willing to risk all. They come from the southern Chinese province of Guangdong, where many face grim futures. China's population is over 400 million. Guangdong's farmers cultivate every possible inch of the steep mountains. In the reign of the young Manchu emperor, Shen Feng, the South faces economic troubles. China has just been defeated by Europeans in the Opium War and must pay reparations. Tax collectors demand ruinous payments that force some farmers to sell their land. The heaviest burden falls on the poor. Then comes word of the discovery of gold. In the port of Canton, where foreign ships dock, rumors fly of a place the first arrivals called Gold Mountain. When this wondrous news of gold, gold in such amounts that you literally could walk along and fill your pockets with nuggets came, it caused a sensation. It's just the concept of gold that could be obtained by, by lowly peasants or ordinary people, workers. Can you imagine for a, a boy living in a village where the land had been plowed for thousands of years, yielding very little? being able to find gold, gold dust, bits of gold, nuggets, it created a dream. Desperation is not the only reason many like Fat Hing Chin dream of Gold Mountain. Guangdong is an enterprising region, the most economically advanced in China. So, 
啊，那那么这也是为什么他们比较有这个开拓精神、创业精精神吧，敢于冒险。你当时要到美洲来不容易啊，你想想看，一片就从来没有啊去过地方，你想还要这个横跨太平洋，说实在的，你没有一个很长时间以来形成的这么一个冒险的意识，是不太敢去的。Many dream of striking it rich in just a few years, and returning home wealthy. Among them, an anxious Fat Hing Chin. He and his fellow passengers are willing to risk their lives for their dreams of gold, but the journey is worse than he imagined. Fierce storms and rough seas batter the ship. Ventilation is poor. Disease quickly spreads. They're sailing in a situation where they're basically being held like livestock. Food would have been terrible. Sanitation, impossible. And if that's not enough, Fat fears they may be sold into slavery. Others have been kidnapped as coolies, virtually slave laborers, in Peru, Cuba. And Hawaii. After three harrowing months, Fat and his companions are ecstatic to finally catch a glimpse of San Francisco's harbor. Little do they know what ordeals will follow. A year ago, when the cry of gold first echoed in the small town of San Francisco, on, most of its inhabitants ran off to the gold fields. One observer writes, an American woman who had recently established a boarding house here pulled up stakes and was off before her lodgers even had time to pay their bills. Eighty thousand people arrive in California. In just the first year alone, now the harbor is packed with abandoned ships that are used to build houses, because the sailors have all gone to look for gold. Immigrants like Fat Hing Chin walk off their ships full of hope, and encounter a strange-looking scene. In 1850, the city is still small, full of rough buildings and tents. Everything is unfamiliar. They join others from every part of the world, from Peru, England, Germany, Australia. From its earliest days, San Francisco is surprisingly ethnically diverse. To Americans, the Chinese men present a curious vision, with their loose clothing and long queues. 那个淘金者哈，是这个美国历史上第一批大量大规模的这个亚洲移民，第一批。They're the oddest-looking set of fellows you ever did see. A visitor to San Francisco writes. They wear their hair flat and hanging down almost to their heels. The Chinese are shocked to see American women wearing strange dresses with bustles, and men and women shamelessly holding hands. As Fat and the others disembark, they're greeted by familiar-sounding voices. It's quite common at that time. Some of the earlier groups to arrive would turn around and send men to the docks and call out in Chinese. Are there any members of the Li family here? Any members of the Chin family? The Wang family? Out of the general babble, someone called out in our local dialect. Immigrant Huey Kin Kwong recalled, and like sheep recognizing the voice only, we blindly followed, and soon were piling into one of the waiting wagons. Today, San Francisco's Chinatown is in the same location it was 150 years ago. Just a few blocks away from here. That's where the Chinese got off the steamers and came up to Chinatown. 
Darren Ao Wing is a fifth generation Chinese American. His great grandfather made the same voyage from the docks as most early immigrants. He's retracing his ancestors' footsteps to learn more about their lives in this new land. One of the first things they did was to come here, stop at a temple, give thanks to the goddess of the ocean for having made it. Also, they would go to one of the benevolent associations, like the one back here, find out what their next steps are. California was a tough place to survive. So the immigrants formed organizations called benevolent associations to help others from the same region. Hi, Mr. Lee. Hi, uh, welcome to Lee's Family Association. Great, thanks. Okay. It's great to meet you. Let me show you. Sure. Dan Lee is the president of one association, which was founded 150 years ago. Today, benevolent societies are in part social clubs. In the 19th century, they were the secret to the immigrant's survival. So I imagine when the, these guys first got here, they were probably pretty scared, didn't quite know what to do. Uh, what kind of help did the association provide for them when they got here? When they come here, we can provide some a room they stay, and some provide them food, and also helping them search a job. <laughs> For Fat and the other immigrants, the benevolent associations, run by merchants who settled in Chinatown, offer a primer on where to go and how to find gold. The benevolent societies made all the difference between being completely lost and knowing what was going on. This is where they found out what to do. For many, Reality sinks in as they realize that they won't get rich overnight. They've traveled on credit and will have to work two years just to pay the shipping merchants back. Fat is luckier. He paid his own way. Still, he decides to join forces with others. The newcomers keep their Chinese clothes and they keep their cues. But well, one of the first purchases almost everyone makes is a pair of sturdy American boots. Within days, Fat and his compatriots set out on a long trek. Throughout California, Prospectors have discovered mountains laced with veins of gold. Rivers and streams eroded them, leaving nuggets of gold nestled in the water between the rocks. Others are making their own arduous journeys to the gold fields. An astounding number, hundreds of thousands, will leave from America's east coast. Gold fever really catches on easily for almost anybody. I mean, gold fever is real. You think, I'm going to go over there and pick gold out of the creek, and uh, it's not going to be that easy. I mean, that's really how it was portrayed. Uh, because initially, when the gold was discovered, I mean, that's what they were doing, is picking nuggets out of the creeks. Because the United States had just taken California from Mexico, the gold lay in land the government considered unclaimed territory. American law was, regarding gold, it belonged to whoever found it. And you didn't have to be an American citizen. You could be a citizen from, you could come from anywhere. You just got there first, you grabbed the gold. That's why it was called a gold rush. California is extremely remote territory. The forbidding Rocky Mountains and thousands of miles separated from the East Coast where most Americans live. Some take 18,000 mile six month journeys around Cape Horn on ships plagued by storm and disease. Some sail to Panama, travel overland, then take another ship to San Francisco. 
others brave the perilous six-month trip. The folks who had the least money of all were the ones who would basically walk. And in those days, it boggles our mind to think that if you wanted to get from Pennsylvania to California, you might walk. But that's what they did back then. Very often, even when they had wagons, even when they had horses, they would walk. Because the horses and the, the wagons didn't go any faster than a person could walk. While the eastern U.S. is well settled, the interior, from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, is unknown territory. Its vast treeless plains, with unpredictable rainfall, appear unsuitable for farming. They'll have to travel through land belonging to fierce Native American tribes, like the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Crow. Long lines of wagon trains set out from the Missouri River. Cholera, typhus, and dysentery kill thousands along the way. One immigrant writes home, a great many hours of the day, we could see companies stopped on the side of the road to bury their dead. We passed one grave with three buried in it. After crossing a great desert, and months of grueling travel, they finally reached the treacherous Rocky Mountains. To traverse them before snow falls, many must abandon their possessions. Some arrive in California malnourished and sick. Yet, like the Chinese, many of their greatest challenges are yet to come. As prospectors race for California's gold, some venture far north of Sacramento to the Trinity River. In 1848, a miner discovered gold here and took home $80,000 in just six weeks. The equivalent of over two million dollars today. He couldn't keep the location secret long. Thousands of prospectors flock here. Everything is packed in by mule or on the backs of men. The first camps are tents or shelters between rocks. The buildings, crude cabins. A local paper, the Shasta Courier, reveals surprise at the arrival of newcomers in this remote mountainous region. An immense number of picturesquely dressed sons of the Orient passed through, a reporter writes. Each man had a long pole slung across his shoulder. Pendant from either was about 50 pounds weight how these little, weakly-looking hombres manage to carry such loads over such mountains is what we cannot possibly comprehend. Fateng Chin and his party arrive at a mining camp and find a bewildering array of characters from every walk of life. Scottish lords, Irish potato farmers, Massachusetts carpenters, In this rough place, full of adventurers, speculators, and gamblers, fortunes are easily made and lost. It was lawless, and sometimes it was dangerous. There were robbers. There were no banks. Obviously, there are no credit cards. And so whatever you dug out of the ground, what you kept on your person. The only law is vigilante justice. Few women live here except ladies of pleasure. In the largely male camps, prostitution is common and accepted. In the very, very early days, there were hardly any women. Uh, there are stories where 
Men would get so excited if they saw a woman that they just almost passed out. Like most miners, Fat Hing's group camps by the river, close to their claim, so no one jumps it. Day after day, they spend hours in ice-cold water, searching for gold. Swirling gravel in a pan washes away the lighter rocks and sand, leaving the heavier gold at the bottom. The sun in that part of California could be brutally hot, so you're freezing from the waist down, and you're boiling from the waist up. And you know that it's a matter of chance, whether you move this rock, you move this sand, whether you find anything or not. Mining with rocker boxes is more efficient. Flushing the gravel with water leaves the gold to settle in grooves at the bottom of the box. But the miners still have to move a lot of rocks and dirt. It was almost literally back-breaking work. A miner might expect to move a ton of rock in terms of gravel, sand, and the like in order to get an ounce of gold. This was manual labor carried to something of an extreme. Fat is elated. In these early days, gold is still plentiful. He makes almost $12 a day. In the US, that's not bad. In China, it's more than he would have made in two months. Holding on to his savings is not easy. Gambling is popular entertainment. <laughs> Fat resists the temptation. In just two years, he saves almost $600. $20,000 in today's currency enough to return home to his family. In Guangdong, Fat is now a prosperous man. He builds a home for himself and his parents. He buys land and he marries. Fat has achieved his dream. The success of a lucky few like him inspires many others to journey to Gold Mountain. The hope that he can make much greater wealth even draws fat back to California. But this time, finding gold will not be as easy. While a few grow rich, many are finding it difficult to survive. In 1853, when Fat Hing Chin returns, the scene has changed. Overnight, San Francisco has become a large proper city with banks, theaters, elegant stores, and a population of over 30,000. Millionaires live in fashionable houses and dine on gold plates. The gold that was extracted from California and other mines in the American West essentially doubled the world's supply of gold in the space of 25 years. Miners are still pouring into the gold fields. This time, Fat decides to strike out on his own with his brother and cousin. As they trek through the wilderness, they look out for Native Americans. Miners are rapidly encroaching on their land and threatening their way of life. The Native Americans mostly were peaceful. 
However, there were some tribes that uh, felt that they had been abused and they attacked whites and Chinese. And if you were in a small group, uh, you had to be quite wary. Fat's group walks for a week. They're relieved to finally arrive safely at the Trinity River. They stake a claim and begin sifting through dirt and gravel. But after three months, they have little to show for it. Most newly arriving Anglo miners face similar frustrations. Hundreds of thousands have already picked over the gold fields. The easily found surface gold is gone. To find gold now, large teams must dam rivers. They pulverize mountainsides with hydraulic pumps to expose ancient riverbeds. And they dig shafts to mine beneath the ground. Wealthy financiers bankroll these operations. Most newcomers only survive by working for them as lowly wage laborers. Until now, there have been perhaps only 5,000 Chinese in the gold fields. But in 1852, the Taiping Rebellion, a devastating civil war in China, flares up. And 20,000 Chinese arrive in California. A newspaper man writes, every gulch and ravine is filled with Chinese miners. An American can hardly find room to pitch a tent. The Chinese, become targets of resentment. They appear to be so different. And while Americans expect that new arrivals will want to become American, most Chinese don't plan to stay. This seemed to be a case of, well, they're just grabbing these resources and sending them off home or taking the money and running on home with it. They didn't seem to be part of the the California community, and they didn't seem to want to be. Now, part of the reason they didn't want to be was they weren't welcome. So it was a case where what you expect tends to produce what you get. In 1852, the governor of California, John Bigler, charges that most Chinese are ignorant of US laws and not interested in becoming citizens. Bigler demands a law to stop what he calls a tide of Asiatic immigration. The eloquent merchant and Chinese spokesman, Norman Ah Sing, immediately writes a letter to the newspaper challenging Bigler's claims. Some Chinese, like himself, do want to join American society. Sir, I'm a Chinaman, a Republican, and a lover of free institutions and much attached to the principles of the government of the United States. You argue that this is a republic of a particular race. This proposition is false in the extreme, and you know it. The declaration of your independence and all the acts of your government, your people, and your history are against you. 
所以他让大家看说，你看，我们华人也是美国社会，也是加州这个文化里面的一个重要的组成部分。呃，我们有中国人的传统，但是我们也也愿意加入到这个美国的这个历史进程、美国的文化，啊、呃，社会的中的、呃、成为中间的一个分子。He was pointedly very clear about the hypocrisy of talking about an American system which supposed equality and democracy but excluded some by race. Ah Sing's eloquence. Does little to change opinion in the lawless gold fields, where the chun counter violence. Although California belonged to Mexico just a few years earlier, Anglo's, unhappy at the competition, have driven off thousands of Spanish-speaking miners who came from Mexico, Peru, and Chile. They even expel miners from France. In the middle of the 19th century, racism was common and even respectable. There was discrimination on the basis of ethnicity and race. There was discrimination on the basis of nationality. People looked down on the French, and they looked down on the Australians. And not unnaturally, each race tended to put itself at the top of the hierarchy, and the other races were graded below. In some gold fields, the Chinese also face hostility. If they stumble on a lucrative claim, as Fat Hing Chin does, there's often trouble. Not infrequently, if you discovered gold and you had a successful claim, you might be driven off by others who were envious of the amount of gold that you were getting. We have to remember most of these Chinamen who were arriving were strangers to the use of guns. Law is not on the Chinese side. The California legislature imposes a tax on foreign miners. The sheriff would go out on a monthly basis and collect a four-dollar fee from the Chinese, and other foreigners, you know, from other countries, were not taxed. It was just the Chinese. The tax will fund over a quarter of California's state revenue. For almost 20 years, in 1854, a racist judge rules that the Chinese cannot testify against whites in court. The law means that Chinese can be shot with few consequences. The law was on the books for 17 years. That meant the Chinese were fair game. They had no civil rights. They could be attacked. Without、um, repercussions. In a lawless place that attracts unsavory characters, Chinese are sometimes robbed and occasionally murdered. Despite the dangers, the Chinese establish many thriving communities. In California's Trinity County, Darren Al Wing is on his way to visit a town there called Weaverville, a community similar to those his great uncle once visited. He wants to see for himself how the Chinese lived and worked. Here, in 1853, the county's miners decide whether to expel the Chinese, as some others have. Today, we took a vote upon the question of whether or not the Chinese should be permitted to remain on this flat, which resulted in favor of their being permitted to enjoy the same rights and privileges as other foreign miners. Darren is meeting two descendants of miners at the site of an old Chinese temple. I had four <laughs> sets of great grandparents that were here. Richard Lorenz's great grandfather arrived here from Portugal to seek gold. Darrow Forslund's came from Germany. 
I had a grand uncle who was traveling around the different Chinese mining towns providing Chinese medical assistance. So if he came up here during that time, what would he have seen? In as early as 1854, there was many as 1,600 and so Chinese here. At one point, they could have been as many as half the population of this county. And Chinatown was over in this direction. They had stores, doctor's offices. They had a gambling house. And right in the middle of Chinatown was a brewery that was there before Chinese people got here. So they kind of built around the brewery. I would do the same. <laughs> same. Good choice. I grew up, and most people I know grew up with the notion that there was one Chinatown in San Francisco Chinatown. It's still very new to me to learn that there were Chinatowns all over California. In the 1850s, California is full of large Anglo operation and hydraulic mines. The Chinese largely focus on river mining, where they excel. Around Weaverville, many Anglos worked their claims quickly and then sold them to Chinese miners. So is this one of the places where Chinese would have been looking for gold? Most definitely. This is what they would call pay dirt right in here. The first guys were here, they, they wanted the easy pickings and then moved on. But the Chinese came in and the Chinese were much more industrial. And they worked harder. They really worked the ground and got down in the crevices and, and picked up the gold that the first miners missed. The Chinese, who once farmed rice, are especially skilled at diverting water. They introduced the Chinese pump, which is adopted throughout California. They built large water wheels to ferry water onto the riverbanks to mine the gravel. Like Anglos, once the Chinese mine the riverbanks down to bedrock, they divert water to go after gold at the bottom of the rivers. They would uh, build small dams, we call them wing dams, and basically enclose a section of the river. And the rest of the river is still flowing. They would put a wheel and pump the water out of the area that they'd enclosed. And once they got to the bed of the river again, they could go in and mine just like they had before with rock. But they were actually mining in the bed of the river. The Chinese can afford to be thorough. Typically, 一天只能赚一毛钱,一毛五分钱美金的这样的收入. The Chinese are so thorough that in another town, two miners buy another miner's cabin and collect $2,000 of gold dust from its floorboards. Even laundrymen find that thoroughness pays. The laundrymen knew that the, the miners would take out of their pockets when they brought their dirty clothes in to be washed. But there was a lot of gold dust in the bottom of those pockets that they didn't worry about. So the Chinese traditionally would turn all the pockets inside out, wash them very, very good, and then at the end of the day's business, they would then empty the big wash tubs that they were using and then pan out all the dirt that was in the bottom of the wash tubs for the gold dust from the miners' pockets. California's most lucrative mining operations are owned by Anglos. But by the mid-1850s, Chinese run many modest river operations. One in every five California miners is Chinese, and they've sent millions home. Holidays like New Year's allow them to celebrate their successes. On January 31st, writes the Shasta Courier, the annual festival of the Chinese commenced at noon. It was a glorious time. thousand dollars were expended in fireworks.
But while some Chinese companies and a few individuals do well, many ordinary miners are not so lucky. My beloved wife, one miner writes, yesterday I received another of your letters. I could not keep the tears from running down my cheeks when thinking about the miserable and needy circumstances of our home. Who could know that fate is always opposite to man's design? Because I can get no gold, I'm detained in the secluded corner of a strange land. My son, a mother writes, I hope you'll be home and get married while I'm alive so that I may die with my eyes closed without grievance. You should save some money and should come back at least the next year. You won't see me anymore. Come back. Don't forget your mother, please. Many are between a rock and a hard place. If they go back to China, they can't support their families. So they stay, send money home through a network of merchants and clan members, and face the loneliness of separation. In Weaverville, some found a refuge. It's one of the oldest Chinese temples in America. In use since 1853, and rebuilt in 1874. Jack Frost is the keeper of the temple, now a state park site. So this is the temple of the forest beneath the clouds. The colors are really important. They've got red on the front of the building, which is the color of good luck. There's also the color of wealth and prosperity by the gold. We had to step over these thresholds and they're here because of the old belief that evil spirits are extremely lazy and will not put out the effort to actually step over the thresholds. So we leave all evil spirits outside. I just thought this was uh, good construction to make a strong yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it had a higher purpose. It has a higher purpose. It's beautiful. It is, isn't it? It's a very uplifting feeling when you come in. So a it, very, very special place for them. The temple is still in use today. Some of the artifacts were gifts from the Emperor of China. This is the main altar area for the temple. Spirit houses contain the statues of ancestors. Each statue represents a real person that lived in the Three Kingdoms time period. The incense and the smoke transmitted their thoughts, their hopes, their wishes to their families or to one of their ancestors. I just can't imagine how lonely I would have been if I had come over 18 oh. years old, 20 years old, coming here, could kind of, they could feel they were part of something again. To reconnect must have been just so important to them. And at least here, at Chinese New Year's, they felt like they were together again, because they knew that the family would be in a Joss house, back home, celebrating the day, doing all the old traditions. Here in the temple, it all brought it back together for them. Life outside is harder. The high foreign miners' tax and the difficulty of finding gold drive many Chinese from the gold fields. Some peddle vegetables from their garden or find work as manual laborers. Fat considers returning home. Then he receives an unexpected offer. 
His cousin asked him to help open a restaurant in San Francisco. He leaps at the chance. From the earliest days of the gold rush, Chinese restaurants, with their inexpensive tasty food, are a draw for Anglos and for Chinese miners who are far from home. They're even mentioned in travel guides. As early as 1851, one traveler notes, the best eating houses in San Francisco are kept by celestials and conducted in Chinese fashion. I was not curious enough to inquire as to the ingredients. Let others go after gold in the hills, Fat tells a friend. I'll wait for gold to come to the city. Like many other merchants, Fat has discovered that the fastest way to riches is to sell goods to miners. He will live here for years and prosper. By the mid-1850s, many others have settled in Chinatown, which is now an important part of San Francisco. Chinatown was bustling. You had thousands of new arrivals coming here, trying to figure out where they're going, heading out into the hills to look for gold. But at the same time, you had people who had found gold coming back here, looking for merchants and businesses, and there's entertainment. My grandfather became a Chinese opera star and performed here in San Francisco as well as up and down the west coast of the United States in different Chinese communities. As busy as Chinatown is, its streets are graced by only a few women. A small number of merchants have sent for their wives, but most men don't want to bring their wives over. They're taking care of their parents and children at home and they intend to rejoin them. The lyrics of a Taishan song reflect their wives' hopes. I beg of you after you depart to come back soon. Our separation will only be a flash of time. I only wish that you would have a good fortune. Also, I beg of you that your heart won't change. that you keep your heart and mind on taking care of your family. Each month or half a month, send a letter home. In two or three years, my wish is to welcome you home. In Gold Mountain, some miners and merchants achieve their dreams. They become wealthy or comfortable enough to return home Others visit every five to ten years or wait far longer. And some will decide to put down roots and stay in America. Their remittances and loyalty become a lifeline to family at home. As conditions in southern China worsen, and many peasants face civil war, banditry and starvation. The trails the first wave of immigrants blazed would inspire many others to try their luck in Gold Mountain. <laughs>